Notice is hereby given of the regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Town of Westfield in the County of Union, New Jersey at 7.30 p.m. on the evening of Tuesday, May 21st, 2013 in the boardroom of the Administration Building, 302 Elm Street, <coughs> Westfield, New Jersey. The purpose of the meeting is to transact the regular business of the board and to transact any other business that may come properly before the board. <coughs> This is to advise the general public and to instruct that it be recorded in the minutes that in compliance with chapter 231 of the public laws of 1975 entitled the Open Public Meetings Act, the Westfield Board of Education on Friday, May 17th, 2013, caused to be posted at the office of the Board of Education located at 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey, and delivered to the Westfield Leader, the Star Ledger, the Westfield Library, the Town Clerk of Westfield, Alternative Press, and Patch.com, a meeting notice setting forth the time, date, and location of the meeting. Dana, can we do a roll call? Rich Matazza? Here. Lucy Beagler? Ann Carey? Here. Mark Friedman? Here. Brendan Galligan? Here. Roseanne Persa? Yes. Ginny Light? <coughs> Here. Gretchen Olick? Mitch Slater? Here. All right. Mitch, can you lead us in place? Mm -hmm. Sure. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Announcements. Brendan, anything going on? Yes, this comes to us from the intermediate schools. The Germ Busters team comprised of five Roosevelt Intermediate School students, won second place in the United Healthcare YMCA fourth annual Health B competition. They competed against seven other teams and reached the final rounds. The seventh graders are Julian Mazzola, Owen Heim, Stefan Sujan Thakurmar, Connor Smith, Joey Gabriel, and Matthew Musel. The $500 award grant money received by the team will be used for any health-related materials and activities which benefit all stu the students of Roosevelt. The Health Bee is in a Jeopardy-style physical activity and nutrition competition. The students make a commitment to gain a greater knowledge of health and physical fitness along the way, meet other peers of their age from surrounding schools. This year's special guest at the Health Bee was Brenda Blackman, co-author of My Nine News. <coughs> okay, we have a couple of announcements. This first one is from uh, just general community. Uh, May is Older Americans Month. And this week, students from Westfield High School visited some older residents of Westfield and made their day a little brighter. More than 20 members of the Westfield High School Choral provided entertainment for the Westfield, that was Corral, provided entertainment for the Westfield Senior Citizens Housing Complex. The songs included challenging pieces, including those in French, Italian, and German. The senior citizens were very impressed and described their students as very talented, professional, and really marvelous. One woman said she uh, just loved the kids and the conductor, who was vocal music teacher, John Brzezowski. We also have uh, a number of announcements from athletics. Peter Fagan, our state pole vaulting champion, surpassed his own Westfield High School pole vault record at last night's East Coast Relays with a jump of 16 feet. Uh, this is also a Union County record and a meet record. At the Union County track and field meet that was held at Plainfield High School on May 16th, at the May 16th, our boys placed first, second, and third in the mile run. Matt Lupino, Phil Edwards, and Kevin Smith in that order. Congratulations to those three guys. Uh, also, on Saturday, May 18th, the JV baseball team won the Union County tournament by defeating, uh, I guess that's South, uh, I guess that was Scotch Plains, 3-0. Uh, so congratulations to them. Also, the softball team will compete in the Union County Finals on Saturday, May 25th at Kane University. Good luck to these fine competitors. And lastly, uh, this coming Friday afternoon at 4 p.m., the varsity baseball team will play in the quarterfinals of the state tournament against Linden uh, at home in Westfield. So good luck to, uh, to uh, the baseball team. I think that's it. Okay, and this is for Westfield High School Fine Arts. Congratulations to the cast and crew of Bat Boy the Musical for receiving 10 final nominations and two honorable mentions from the Paper Mill Playhouse Rising Star Awards. Senior Matt Lynn played the role of Bat Boy and received a nomination for Outstanding Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role. 
the ensemble of 28 students received a nomination for outstanding performance by a chorus. Vocal teacher John Brzezowski, I just told him how to say it, now I can't say it. <laughs> Otherwise known as Mr. B, was nominated for outstanding achievement in music direction. Mr. B also conducted the orchestra, which received a nomination for outstanding performance by an orchestra. Megan Mulrooney was nominated for outstanding performance by an actress in a supporting role. Asher Horowitz received a nomination for outstanding achievement in lobby display. And Alexa Derman was nominated for outstanding hair and makeup achievement. Honorable mentions for best overall production and best director to Dan Devlin were also announced. Nominations for the Student Achievement Awards went to Geneva Gleason for costume design, Chris Sabatino for film, computer, and animation, and to Lydia Oquando for stage manager. The Rising Star Award Corps of Evaluators attend 100 high school productions throughout the state. The final award recipients will be announced June 4th at Paper Mill Playhouse. We wish all our shining stars the best of luck in these selections. And in Intermediate Fine Arts, it was a great day at the Bucks County Playhouse Theater Festival on Monday, May 6th for Roosevelt Intermediate Drama students who competed against more than 100 other students. The students' production of Spoon River Anthology received the Outstanding Middle School Ensemble Award. Megan O'Connell was named Outstanding Actress, and Samantha Greenaway captured the Spotlight Award. Congratulations to these students and to teacher director Kimberly Johnny. Congratulations to all. Jenny, yes. Oh, sure. Um, I have news from Westfield High School regarding student achievement. Congratulations to nine additional Westfield High School seniors who achieved perfect 800 scores on their SATs. They include, for math, Elizabeth Gonzalez, for writing, Kristen Haig, Claire Lee, Lily Wang, Nicole Devitt, and David Kruskin. For reading, Alexander Beals and Alexandra Mosovir. <coughs> And for reading and writing, Mark Gillespie. And in another um, announcement for Westfield High School student achievement, congratulations to the 160 juniors and 10 seniors from Westfield High School who were inducted into the National Honor Society on April 25th in recognition of academic excellence, leadership, service, and character. Principal Peter Renwick and Les Jacobson, who is our National Honor Society advisor, awarded the students with certificates and pins. Officers of the National Honor Society at Westfield High School, Rob Cassie, Eric Oberman, Maria Hershey, and Sophia Barry announced the newly inducted members. The names of the 170 newly inducted National Honor Society students are posted on the district's website. Elected for the 2013-14 school year as officers of the National Honor Society, are Francis Wong, Shay Fitzpatrick, Abigail Cook, Lauren Nogan, and Natalie Brennan. Congratulations to these students. Hoops for Hope, an annual basketball clinic and fundraiser for the Westfield chapter of Girls Learn International, was held again this spring at Westfield High School. Girls Learn International is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting gender equality and literacy throughout the world. Nine members of the Westfield High School basketball team conducted drills for girls in grade four through eight. The high school team also spoke to the girls about conditioning, how to avoid sports injuries, and they shared their wisdom on the benefits of sports for girls. Karen Lust, Roosevelt Social Studies teacher and Westfield Schools volunteer advisor for GLI, explained that all money raised will go towards literacy programs at Abdullah bin, I think right, Abdullah bin Omar School in Afghanistan the partner school for the Westfield chapter of Girls Learn International for the past five years. Members of the WHS girls basketball team included Lizzie Ponce, Chrissy Ferraro, Emily Schumann, Colleen Gallagher, the awesome Rachel Matesic, um, Lillian Scott, Carly Friedman, Jacqueline Knapp, and Caroline Kazmarski. Members of the high school chapter of Girls Learn International included Charlie O'Brien, Cassie Teschner, Helen Sparrow, Isabel Gelfan, Aditi Jain, Jean, not sure on that one, and Megan Bloodfield. Congratulations to all girls. 
The Westfield Board of Education candidates deadline is June 4th. Westfield residents interested in becoming a Board of Education member for a three-year term, 2013 through 2016, must file a petition in person in the office of the county clerk at 2 Broad Street, room 113, Elizabeth, on or before 4 p.m. on June 4th, 2013. The actual election will take place on Tuesday, November 5th, 2013. The members whose terms are expiring on the Westfield Board of Education include Ginny Lights, Mitch Slater, and Brendan Galligan. They have not announced their intention of seeking re-election as, uh, as of this date. Questions can be referred to the Union County Election Supervisor, Lisa Hugelmeyer, at 908-527-4996. That's 908 Five two seven four nine nine six. Information is available at the county clerk's website at www.ucnj.org backslash cty clerk c l e r k. So May has been a much celebrated month in the Westfield Public Schools. You've heard some of the announcements, but I have just a few more. We had four different commendations that were bestowed on our students or staff at official state ceremonies in Trenton. And I was able to go to the two <coughs> award ceremonies that did take place in Trenton. On May 2nd, Westfield High School seniors Michael Kirkland and Matthew Lynn were presented with New Jersey Governor's Award in Arts Education. And both of these accomplished students are members of the select group of singers we heard about before, the chorale, and they also have appeared in dramas and musicals. And then on May 15th, the New Jersey Commissioner of Education, Christopher D. Cerf, and the New Jersey State Board of Education, President uh, Arcelio Aponte, personally congratulated representatives from Westfield High School for significant contributions to school, community, and family. They honored our community service club at the high school, and that club received a certificate from the state and was commended for the club's continuous volunteer efforts over the past seven years. They provide assistance locally, statewide, and internationally to those in need. Um, honored that day were the club's moderator and founder, who has been there for all seven years, Mr. Warren Hines. And additionally, we had a number of students, including Tristan Abea, Allison Sprung, Phoebe Ahrens, Jesse Murray, Hannah deconig Teasdale, Eric Herber, Emily Simpson, and Sonia Kader. And I had the pleasure of being there along with uh, Principal Peter Renwick and the Interim Union County Executive Superintendent Kathleen Sarafino, as well as many proud family <coughs> members who were able to take their students down to, uh, to Trenton. You know, at every, uh, as you heard tonight and as regular viewers to, this, uh, to the board meeting know, we regularly acknowledge students for their academic awards and their athletic awards and how well we do in fine arts. But it was great to see a group of uh, students who generally work in the background quietly helping people who are in need um, be in the forefront, have pictures taken, and get recognition uh, not only locally but at the state level. And also at that ceremony uh, with the state board, our, one of our master technology teachers, Janine Gottko, who was the master technology teacher for kindergarten through fifth grade, she was also honored by the state board for her work um, supporting the infusion of technology into instruction in all of our uh, elementary grades. So uh, it was wonderful to have the accolades bestowed, not only here in Westfield, but um, for the state of New Jersey. So May has been a great month. The next Board of Education meeting will be held Tuesday, June 11th. We will begin our meeting with a recognition of Westfield's secondary school teachers, Pam Friedman from Roosevelt and Debbie Vizos from Edison, who were selected as Optimists of Westfield Intermediate Teachers of the Year. And Westfield High School Teachers of the Year, Andrea Hill, Stephen Boyle, and Zorana Koljak. The meeting will start at 7.30 p.m at 302 Elm Street. With that, I'd recognize the public for agenda items only. If you just state your name and address. Liz Mahalan, 1029 Harding Street. Um, there was two issues I wanted to talk about. One was agenda items, so I guess I'll talk about the other issue later. 
Um, the agenda item I wanted to discuss was the SDA assessment. I think it's a great thing that you're doing, that you are doing this resolution and reaching out to legislators. Because honestly, I, I attend the state meetings every month, and I can tell you they look through hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents, and they don't find the small details unless we bring it to their <coughs> attention. Um, I did reach out to um, Education Law Center to ask what they had heard was going on throughout the state. And there are several districts similar to you that are reaching out to the um, legislators to let them know about their disappointment. <coughs> uh, happily, I, I'd like to say that um, they are listening and they do hear your voices. And it's very hopeful that if we continue to reach out, especially to the budget committee members who have the ultimate authority to persuade this to be removed from the budget, um, we could have that $75,000 restored. I have a letter here because I wasn't sure um, how the district was going to proceed, but I do have a letter here that maybe you'd like to take a look at and possibly pass on to as many stakeholders and constituents uh, that you could find. I also have listed on the back all of the contacts for the budget um, committee members that you might want to reach out to who have the uh, authority to possibly negotiate that from being pulled from the budget so that we can have that 75000 restored. And uh, thank you on behalf of taxpayers <laughs> for taking this. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I have a few copies if you want. Thank you very much. So Ann Carey heads our legislation committee, and I believe you'll be <coughs> speaking about that uh, later on in the meeting. Yes. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one come to the podium, we'll move to the superintendent's report. Great, well this evening we're, uh, we're very excited about the superintendent report. Um, you know, at, at the board table we are um, constantly working on various goals that come from our strategic plan. And two areas that have come forward in our strategic plan that we have worked on more than this year, um, one has to do with technology in general, and the other has to do with the integration of science, technology, engineering, and math, what is commonly known as STEM. Um, those are two areas which, again, we heard from, about from the community when we were constructing our strategic plan and that we have worked on. One was a goal last year, the other is a goal this year, and continue to work on. We've spent a great deal of time, we've made strides in the district, and we have our assistant superintendent for curriculum, Mr. Pinero, who's going to be uh, presenting about that this evening. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Dolan. And hello, everyone. Uh, I guess it's just over a little more over a year that we started rolling out our initiative for technology, the Walls to Windows initiative, as, as we came to term it. After a lot of hard work from uh, technology staff, curriculum staff, uh, at that at the ad hoc tech committee, uh, which is what it was called at the time, and uh, hours, and we met every Friday morning, and and really uh, developed a plan, a long-term plan, a short-term plan, uh, and a guidebook in some ways, which which was our presentation last year, for uh, putting this initiative in place and bringing our students um, into the world of 21st century learning. And so uh, what I thought we could do tonight would be to do an update by first looking at some of our slides, the key slides from last year's presentation that introduced the initiative and, and its steps. So uh, this, this is an uh, icon, an image that many of us will remember. I'm sure the community remembers as well. Uh, but the satellites circle around the first big investment in this initiative, and that was the infrastructure and delivery. Uh, with that in place, which was, as, as I said, a, a significant investment in time and funding, uh, we were then able to address the satellites, which are the curriculum and instruction and the professional development that would go with helping teachers to implement, as well as uh, personnel, staffing that would be required for the initiative, and policy. So in rolling out the Walls to Windows Technology Initiative, this was the original goal, it is the original goal, and that was to create a connected and collaborative school community that empowers Westfield students to thrive as 21st century learners. 
Uh, we, we bring um, the world to the classroom through wireless access. That was one of the, the three aspects of the goal. Deploy devo de uh, devices to connect students and create a platform for 24-7 access. And to prepare students for problem solving in the future by providing uh, these techni uh, technology enhanced activities. The tools as we listed last year um, were that we would be deploying towards the towards executing the initiative included all of these devices and applications. Ultimately, the tablets became um, iPads primarily, and uh, that was a big piece of our initiative rollout this year. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a moment. This next slide demonstrates the timeline. Every project needs project management, and this timeline demonstrates how we would. Uh, roll out the different aspects from that uh, that image. So you see the curriculum from the curriculum satellite up is up there. The policy, professional development as it connects to curriculum. In there, you see the wireless uh, <coughs> infrastructure, devices, devices we rolled out in, in two waves, and of course the personnel. So uh, here, this now begins the official portion of the update. The the initial slides were all really from taken from last year's presentation so uh, this next slide will show you the timeline but now it's amended with uh, the progress that we've made this year for each of those areas um, so it's in blue italic if, if, if you're in the audience and you have black and white we will post the presentation as always and you'll be able to to see some of those details if needed um, but you'll see under curriculum that we list the tech standards are infused into all revised and new curricula uh, this year always look to um, make sure that we use technology in uh, delivering our instruction, but um, we were particularly interested in seeing how some of our new devices and new infrastructure would be able to facilitate that a little further. Uh, under policy, we studied to an extent bringing your own device. That's one of the to one of the main policies, or I should say, one of the main aspects of the uh, user agreement that we have with students and staff: the acceptable use policy. And um, we've examined school districts similar to ours and throughout the country. And uh, it's, it's an opportunity bringing your own device to school for students uh, to really expand uh, to a one-to-one -one, or at least uh, to make sure that we have more access uh, to the internet and uh, 21st century learning. So we're working on what that would mean to our infrastructure. Clearly, if you put thousands of students uh, on the internet at the same time using multiple devices, you might run into some issues. So we are rolling that out in little pilots, pod pilots, um, and we can report a little bit on one of those later on. Um, so that's part of the policy piece. Under professional development, and we began in August with an in-service for the entire district, particularly focused uh, at the high school where it was 100% technology uh, professional development. Throughout the year, we did in-class coaching, after-school coaching, during prep periods, lunchtime, online, and a, a huge portion of that had to do with the next timeline, which was hiring personnel. So for the professional development piece, we, we added to our instructional technology specialists, we added two uh, master technology teachers. So their full-time role was to uh, go into classrooms and work with teachers, work with them on their off time, after school, lunches, and so forth. Uh, we'll see some specifics of their impact a little bit later. Uh, we also added an information systems manager. Um, and these days, that was that is crucial with the amount of synchronized data that the state requires us, or data that the state requires us to synchronize between our uh, district database for student information, which is Genesis, and the, the state's database. So to synchronize that is a big job linking ultimately course codes as well as student IDs, staff IDs. So uh, that was a very strong uh, hire. And I think the, uh, the board and the district showed a lot of foresight by including that as part of our staffing uh, in, in the initiatives and goals. So uh, moving on, you see the ongoing commitments, the areas that we were committed to. This is, uh, again, last year's slide are right there for you. There are four main points. We determined. Uh, that the infrastructure should be evaluated in an ongoing basis, and that we would uh, refresh the, the devices regularly, uh, that professional development would be ongoing and sustained, and uh, the staffing as would be as it's reflected in this year's 
the 2013-14 budget, which was recently presented, that the staffing needs will be reflected in there as well. And uh, that's when we saw the master technology teachers um, being put in place again for another year. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, okay. So starting with the idea of professional development, we began the year with a, a survey. Uh, this happens to be the elementary technology survey. There was also one done at the se secondary level. Just as a quick review, the two master technology teachers, one covered, uh, as Dr. Dolan mentioned a little earlier, K through five, the other one, uh, six through eight. Uh, Janine Gottko is the K through five, and Nancy Latimer is uh, the six through 12. So I think I said six through eight, six through 12. So this was an early survey that we did to get a sense of the teacher's needs. We did that as soon as we got into uh, the school year. And based on, on that survey, the next slide is going to show you some, and it's actually two slides worth, but we could stay here for a second. Um, ultimately, there were 28 topics and courses that were uh, provided to teachers. On the right-hand side, you see that it was uh, primarily the master technology teachers, but uh, we also still have a lot of uh, support for our staff from instructional technology specialists. They're still classroom <coughs> teachers, but they, uh, they find time in, in the course of their school day to, to work with teachers troubleshooting and also providing some professional development support. Uh, we also have, you know, don't want to forget that there are teachers who are just early adopters and very tech savvy, and they will also offer and uh, register people to come after school and work with them. So uh, this is, and of course we have out of district consultants from time to time. Last year, it was mostly in that August in service. So here's some, and here's the next batch. So. You might see some common themes in there, but certainly of all these topics, you see a lot of apps. You see apps that specifically relate to different kinds of classes. Uh, I guess some of the hot ones this year for us were Nearpod, uh, Socrative was, um, was a big one. Um, a lot of social media, it could be something like Edmodo, um, or it could be um, something like Evernote, where students and, and teachers were sharing uh, notes and working collaboratively on developing um, research on uh, different topics in their classrooms. Uh, Google, blogging, and the whole nine. So, yes. Uh, so here's just a couple of figures to come out of, um, come out of this year and, and the training records wow. that I have. So teachers participate in over 7,000 hours of after school and lunchtime professional development via MT, the master technology teachers, the instructional technology specialists, and tech savvy colleagues. So that alone accounted for uh, a lot of hours. And uh, over 200 teachers worked in one-to-one -one situations with master technology teachers. Uh, on a regular basis, uh, the master technology teachers blog for their staff. Um, and I, I, we all had an opportunity to kind of keep up with what they were doing. So some of their best practices and some of their most proud initiatives were published as, in, 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 as part of a blog. Uh, that each Nancy and Janine were able to maintain and and you can see a lot of the highlights from the work that they did one-to-one -one with teachers. This next slide here uh, is a newer survey so you saw one from earlier in the year this actually hasn't gone out to staff yet so I'm sure you can't read them but it's uh, from SurveyMonkey and uh, I'll just give you a sense of what those are about so when we do our annual professional development survey, we'll uh, have staff go through this. And what this shows is um, we ask the teachers to rate their knowledge in areas such as using presentation software, using technology to track student progress, uh, formative assessment, parent communication via technology, and more. So these surveys will be anon anonymous so that we can ensure our most accurate assessment of teacher proficiencies and then get a sense of how we can provide uh, the best professional development for them and support. So we're eager to get that information back and we'll be, we'll be um, circulating that shortly. Uh, the next slide starts to outline for, for you the um, outcomes for Westfield. So this is the initial slide that uh, showed the outcomes for Westfield as they were established in February of last year. And we see that uh, students were prepared to excel, as we said earlier, in the 21st century. Um, more like how they learn and behave in life, which is through technology quite a bit, and in a 24-7 type of capacity. Uh, we also wanted to integrate assessment and instruction and, and get a, a more quick, real-time 
understanding of where students are and their understandings, uh, and also to communicate in new and efficient ways and inclusive ways, and that means with the community as well as uh, within our district, and to be exemplars uh, in the district across the state and nation. So here are some examples in the next slide of, of how we were able to achieve some of that. Uh, in the first bullet, we see that uh, we wanted to teach st students in a manner uh, more like how they learned in life. And uh, the Humanities one-to-one -one iPad initiative pilot at the high school is a good example of that. Um, there, uh, in, in that classroom, which we visited quite a bit, the teachers were able to uh, really empower the students to work independently, and uh, they could still monitor what the students were, do uh, were doing. It's not like students have devices and you don't know whether or not they're <laughs> you know, going to Facebook or, or going off in their email or something to that effect. Uh, the level of engagement, which has been true before there were devices, is a good indicator of, of where students are at as far as their focus is concerned. But in uh, this particular case in humanities, the teachers did have an, an, uh, sort of an overarching monitoring system through, through the iPad and the projector to see where people were at and what they were up to. And um, so that was one pilot that really worked out well uh, to demonstrate how students are behaving in our one of our classrooms the way we think they'll be behaving in college and in their careers. Uh, another area that um, we set as a goal from last year was using devices and technology for assessment and doing it in more real time. Um, you might remember that when Dr. King was here talking about the performing arts, she introduced us to uh, an app called Zondel, which was the one where um, you could create quizzes very quickly and get instant response. Uh, she also showed us some, when you played uh, the instruments, when students played instruments into a speaker, it immediately told you the accuracy of, of the notes that they were playing. Uh, you know, in the past, while our teachers are certainly experts, um, there was that whole component of whether or not maybe the teacher was being subjective and mean to the students about whether or not they were playing on key or missed a note and so forth. And uh, certainly that's not a big issue for teachers, but the technologies that uh, Dr. King shared with us showed that um, you can get more instant feedback, and if you recall on the video, uh, students were cheering or moaning if they didn't quite get the result that they were hoping for, but it was all in fun, and they were uh, very, very much engaged. Uh, two other uh, points that uh, were in that the initial outcomes that we were projecting and hoping um, to have success in were are on this slide. One is to communicate uh, in better ways uh, within our community. And uh, one way we did that this year was to continue enhancements of the current district webpage. Uh, Twitter is just one example of that, but I, I did recognize that our uh, community relations <coughs> department throughout the year continued to build on a platform that we knew uh, was going to be transitioned into a new one. And I found that to be, uh, I found that to be very helpful and, and it's, still a, it's still a good source of information for our community and it, it continues to be enhanced. Uh, with that in mind, we are looking forward uh, to the second bullet point in the first bullet point, which is rolling out a new district web host in 2013 and 14. That's uh, one of the number one topics for our Board of Ed Tech Committee, um, planning that project and how it will be rolled out. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more on that when we show you the uh, timeline in just a couple slides. Um, so, so those are uh, two big improvements that we have put in place or at least gotten started this year to go into next year. Uh, with regard to communication in our community. Uh, that other one, being an exemplar district across the state and nation, you know, that, that was sort of a heady goal, and we thought, well, you know, um, you have to shoot high if you're going to achieve high. And uh, we did have some very nice recognition over the course of this year. One was um, National School Board Association recognition for uh, Janine Gatko, uh, which Dr. Dolan mentioned a little earlier, and I have a specific slide to that effect. Um, also, the Tech Day presentation that uh, the Master Technology teachers will be uh, conducting tomorrow in Atlantic City, and I'll be fortunate enough to go down with them and introduce them. And uh, we also, one of our, our uh, Master Tech teachers was also a guest speaker at the annual Westfield Education Foundation Spring Fundraiser. So I have a few more specifics about that. The upper left, you'll see um, Dr. Dolan and, and Janine Gottko uh, celebrating her award at the state. Uh, that award was actually a national award, and it was um, from the National School Boards Association, 20 educators to watch, and uh, 
Janine actually was, she flew out to San Diego to receive that award, and it was quite an experience. And she did bring back a lot of technology information and share that with her teachers. She posted a lot about it on her blog and so forth. Um, when she returned to New Jersey, of course, the New Jersey School Board is, uh, worked with the State Department and honored people like Janine as well, and, and there they are just this week. The bottom one is a picture of, it kind of looks like um, Nancy's about to perform <laughs> sort of a, a nightclub act there. <laughs> um, Don't tempt them. Yes. <laughs> but what Nancy's doing there is she's providing, uh, you know, this was a really special uh, honor for Nancy to appear at the Westfield Education Fund uh, Spring Fundraiser Dinner because uh, it was based on a grant that she had written for. Um, and it was one of the first things she said to me when I was first hired, and you know, this is so that was back in you know December of 2011. And she said, "You've got to help me get this grant through. Uh, we've got big plans." And what it turned out to be that that grant was for an iPad cart that would enable the two teachers in the cross content humanities course, which is English and social studies, to really delve into as we were talking about a 21st century learning environment, uh, an environment that Nancy is an expert in. If you talk to Nancy, she speaks to you in ISTE standards, which is, uh, you know, those are the standards that the, the, the institute that puts out all the standards with regard to instructional technology. Well, she lives and breathes them. In fact, uh, one of her first recommendations as a master technology teacher is that we should build our program around those kinds of standards. And, and I was, uh, you know, savvy enough to listen to the expert. So uh, that, that was just a, a Nancy speaking about that project. So here are just a few more specifics about the recognition that our program has seen so far. This is um, tomorrow's presentation as part of the NJASA, it's the New Jersey Association of School Administrators annual conference, the spring conference. Tomorrow's Tech Day. You see in the catalog, I think this will make our tech committee swell with pride. Uh, the title of our program in the, in the catalog is uh, Walls to Windows Technology Initiative. And um, tomorrow's presentation will really be focusing on the embedded PD nature of, of what the master technology teachers were able to accomplish this year. And that, that one little line there, bridging the gap between how students live and how they learn is, fr is from the ISTE standards language that I just referred to. So that's, um, that's one bit of recognition. The next slide we see um, th th what, what comes next for us. So with regard to instructional technology, We'll be extending this reach uh, from early adopters to all teachers. Uh, I feel like the hours that you saw up on the slide a little earlier, that was a lot of time from a lot of teachers, um, but we got to do a lot more. And um, we have a big goal with making sure that, that everybody can really fu fully utilize the new web page platform that we'll be using. It's not just you know, the, the traditional or old school or older versions of, of school web pages for teachers in particular, where you know you posted your homework, there might have been a calendar and so forth. But now they are part of the tools that we're talking about or can be implemented as part of the tools that we're talking about for 24-7 uh, coursework type um, access. A lot of features that we considered or that you might have even seen listed in those lists of topics and courses that we taught all year. So that web page is something that we really do want to focus on developing our staff to understand and, and really exploit. And of course, we do expect that there will be early adopters and um, they'll be you know, first on board with all the new features, but certainly we want to bring everybody along over time. This is the timeline uh, for the district's new web platform. Um, so it's, it's fresh off the press. Uh, I'm eager to share it with the tech committee when we get together again. And um, we've, we've added some aspects to it. So this is our proposed draft of a project timeline. Uh, May through June, we will um, determine a project manager. Uh, that's May through June of this year. Master tech teachers and instructional tech support teachers will receive vendor training. Um, that's an important piece. They need to be experts. And in fact, I'm glad to say they've demanded immediate full training before the end of the school year so that they can play all summer, which is their language. But in, in, in my world, that means they're preparing for training our staff next year. Um, a third thing we'd like to achieve between May and June of this, the end of this school year is uh, putting together an implementation team to provide insights uh, of all stakeholders. July through August, through, during the summertime, uh, I referenced that we'll have this, the master tech teachers and project manager involved with 
uh, developing what for all intents and purposes would be almost like a curriculum for the rollout of the new web page. Uh, sort of like basic understanding and, and more advanced and um, we'll schedule with staff, our administrators, our whole team will have to really uh, look into our scheduling, look into how we how we operate with staff and when we have access to them and when they have time to articulate and collaborate and that's how we'll deliver that instruction. So that'll be a big challenge for us uh, but we're already working on where, in what ways and, and how we'll have access to staff to provide the training. We also know, in fact, I've already heard that there are staff that, that don't want to wait, which is nice. So it turns out that when we, uh, as we move forward with the new web page, it will, so we'll stay live with our current platform because there's very much, as I said before, important information up there and people do rely on it. And we want our staff to still be able to communicate with, uh, with the parents and, and students as far as their web pages go. But um, those who do want to experiment and start moving over from the old platform to the new platform, they can do so without undoing their existing platform. So over the summer, we will um, welcome anybody who would like to come in and work with us who may want to start building their web pages over and get some bit of an overview. We'll invite them in and we'll, um, we'll do some of that together. Again, as I said, the turn on Time, which is about you know the spring 2 214 uh, bullet there so when we move live it will be later in the year but all along the way teachers can begin migrating so uh, yeah September to December will be the training towards that migration and then and spring of 2014 that's our target time to flip the switch say goodbye to old school center and hello to our new platform so um, before, so we'll just, I'll catch my breath for a second. That was technology, um, <laughs> an update on technology. You know, um, putting that together, I, I knew we did a lot. I, you know, we were all in the middle of a lot of it. But when you, when you put it all together, it's actually, you know, it's pretty rewarding. So that was, that was great fun. Um, I'm about to go into a little bit of a discussion of the STEM initiative, which was maybe a little bit lower on the radar. But uh, are there any comments or questions about uh, technology before we go into STEM? Yeah, if you think, if you go back to the initial satellite, the policy, personnel, curriculum, how far would you say we are into each of those? Like, if you just put a percent on it, in terms of where you want to be on each of them. Oh, well, well where the, you want to be? Yeah. <laughs> Never ends. Right, I was going to say, like, the curriculum piece is ongoing as far as that goes. Every time uh, you get comfortable with something and you feel innovative, there's something else out there that's it's better. So as far as the curriculum and instruction satellite, I think the thing is, remember that one slide where we showed um, the level of comfort or proficiency that uh, in a survey that the teachers would express where they were at. And we expect them to be honest, especially if it's, oh, there it is. Thank you, Dana. Um, so they're going to rate themselves, and, and we're going to encourage them to, to understand that we want to build the professional development and support around their actual needs. So that's one way that we can um, you know, keep closing that gap between uh, where we're at in the uh, delivery of instruction in, in regard to technology, as well as upgrading our curriculum. So percentage-wise, you know, uh, in, in that area, I guess, I, you know, let, let me keep it this way. I, we're not at 50% of where ultimately you would want to be, but you'll never get to 100% if that makes okay. any sense. That's so, you know, I'll just throw that out there. As far as uh, policy goes, uh, I, I do wish I was able to move policy uh, a little faster on, on BYO personally. I feel like, um, you know, we can get there. You know, I, I, the, the idea of supporting that much uh, hitting of that infrastructure is a little bit challenging. So we've started, as I said, piloting it. I would really love to just open the doors to it because teachers really are getting ahead of the curve, or at least they're ready to do more, and we can't necessarily do all of what they're ready for yet, or at least to just fling open the doors of, say, the high school and say, all right, everybody bring in your devices. That's a big deal. So we're moving more slowly and seeing uh, some of the you know, some of the uh, growing pains that, that we can address earlier rather than, than doing something um, that, that really might set back the whole initiative if, if there are too many sort of bugs in it. So uh, I started that with policy. So I'd say policy is, is really a quick and easy one, but, but you know, we haven't, I haven't done the, uh, we haven't gotten to the acceptable use agreement piece. That's quick and easy to do, but we're at like, you know, 20%. Well, I guess 50, 60, because it's an older, an older policy that needs to be revised. So I've had a percentage and on it. You don't, 
you don't have to sell, sell yourself mm -hmm. short, but <laughs> last year we did a lot of looking at other districts and collecting different um, technology policies, mm -hmm. not only BYOD, but social media, acceptable use from all different aspects of the tech, technological world. Um, we just haven't moved it forward mm -hmm. yet, but we've done a lot of the background research. And so I appreciate you. you saying that, yeah. So, I mean. Yeah, we, we do have it. Um, yeah. And then I guess the other piece would have been personnel. And I think uh, that that's up for, for anyone's input as well. But from my standpoint, um, the, the hires that we did uh, to support the professional development as, as well as the data management, which when we did it, I knew it was a good idea. I think it's an even better idea now that I see people scrambling to manage all the data that the, the state is requiring. Um, so I feel like you, you always want more. But I feel like we're staffed the way we need to be right now, which is great. So 100 percent, you know, effective there. As, as proud as I am of uh, the technology committee's hard work on establishing the vision, um, developing words that, that ring very true to me today, still have vitality and are, are reasonable and will live on as we see in the presentation. I think I'm even more proud, hard to be, but more proud of the district's ability to move forward with personnel. We could not have done what we needed to do and we could not be where we are without those hard decisions to allocate funds to put the, the positions in place, but the right people right. in place. So to me, that is a testimony to great foresight. And I, I, would, I would add that we've gone, to, to use your numbers, Rich, we've gone from, in the personnel, zero to 50 immediately. And I think that, the, the, you know, in nine <laughs> seconds, a lot of it's starting um, in December of 11 when you joined us, Paul, yeah. Um, yeah. because that gave us the ability um, and, and, and Ginny and Roseanne and I both attended a conference right before you came, right the week you came. And our goal was to have our district be represented and, and be doing these presentations. Not only are we doing presentations tomorrow, like you said, but you know, one of our master technology teachers is one of the top 20 to watch in the nation. Yeah. And I think that comes from the, the personnel and the leadership, and, and I thank you for that. And I think we are well on our way, and, and the infrastructure, it all started with infrastructure as well. And, and um, I think we are, we've made some really strong leaps. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. But uh, Rich's point, I think, by asking about the percentages is, you know, how much more do we have? And we really have so much more. But the great thing yeah. is that, that staff, staff is demanding more, and they're demanding, um, you know, in a very polite way, but they want more, and they want more training, they want more devices, they want more for their students. And, uh, and, you know, we're, we're ready to move forward and keep providing it. So it is exciting. Um, okay, so if that's, you know, we can always come back to technology again after just a few slides. I'm going to do just a quick overview of the STEM awareness initiative. Um, so what we began as a goal last year was, you know, I, I guess I would say modest to an extent, to create awareness of what is meant by integrated STEM. Um, I put in parentheses there that uh, integrated STEM is, or activities that require the integration or the integrated application of all the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, the fun part for me in getting involved in this initiative when uh, <coughs> I had the good fortune to come here to Westfield was that as an English major, you know, I, I was always sort of uh, liberal arts leaning. And, um, and yet, I, I, I did feel that uh, all, you know, for many years I, I've been drawn to uh, podcasts on science and, and uh, now I recognize that you know, had I been nurtured, perhaps, uh, in growing up more in the sciences, who knows what I may have been able to accomplish. Um, I'm pretty happy with what I have accomplished, but what, what it's done for me is opened up a whole new world. So uh, I still love my language arts. I still love uh, that, that side of my brain. But um, boy, has this been a shot in the arm. I mean, it's like, it's like starting your career all over again, hanging out with some of these staff, teachers, young folks, not so young folks that just are so turned on by this stuff. And now they're at the forefront, and it's really exciting. And, and to watch them brainstorm, uh, it's inspiring. And to see them with all these different ideas, and to finally really be able to have a, a platform um, to really share them and see them embraced. So for this year, it was really just to get that momentum going. And um, some of the activities as, that we did were, this last year we started with a summer training for all for staff who, were, who would like to come in and do some, say, hands-on training with uh, we brought in Chris Anderson, who was affiliated with uh, Teachers College of New Jersey at the time. They have a, 
he was a STEM ad, he was an adjunct there for STEM instruction for uh, teachers. And um, so he came in in the summer, and before he got started with the staff, he did an orientation. And uh, you know, I asked the, the administrators if they'd like to come to it, and they really did come out uh, in full force. And so that was the very important beginning of understanding that uh, you know, STEM means activities that pull together all of those disciplines. And certainly if you talk to Dr. King, she will tell you there's an A in there for STEAM because the arts are also uh, a way to, to, to kind of integrate. Really, you can integrate everything. I mean, social studies, as you, as you may have remembered from um, STEM Day, we, we integrated everything into STEM. So it's really just one big great learning experience. So um, moving out of that training, we had uh, students were excited about STEM through uh, special events and contests, and, and there'll be a slide that shows you uh, some of those recognitions that we enjoyed. STEM Day was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I, I referred to some of these teachers and their activities as sort of like garage band instruction. They really do just, you know, they get their hands dirty, the students get to play with things. It's not expensive equipment always. Sometimes it's like it was on STEM Day, creating flotation devices uh, with like bubble wrap and GI Joes. And they had a lot of fun just pulling the materials together. So uh, STEM Day was a great success. And there was some, some really wonderful uh, crossovers into social studies and, and world languages. And, and one day, I swear, I'm going to bring in the QR codes that, that provided an entire uh, integrated activity with sp the Spanish class and um, science and, and robotics and it was just really inspiring and I could go on and on so I won't the, the last part of that was reviewing curriculum opportunities for fostering interest in STEM careers uh, we did put two new science courses uh, in as electives and I do thank uh, SIP for, for moving quickly on that and, and helping us push that right through and I also thank uh, thank um, Dr. Dolan and Dana for somehow finding room in the budget for those two courses and so we're, we're off and running by adding two electives at the high school that we're excited about forensics and exercise science. Um, so the next slide shows you a little bit of the recognition that uh, I referenced. On the left, um, and there's a quote from Betsy Freeman, who is uh, a big STEM advocate, and uh, it's a big part of all that she does in her fifth grade class. And uh, she was quoted in, in an article um, that, that Lori Karecki put together. Students were thrilled that their work would be shared with others worldwide. This was part of the Smithsonian contest that the students were involved with and won awards in. And she finishes her thought, we become a classroom without walls. So that was like an unsolicited uh, reinforcement <laughs> of our technology initiative. And so good for, good for us, good for Ms. Freeman. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the robotics team. And as you know, that's a relatively new course. It's, I wouldn't call it brand new because this was its second year. Wait, First yeah. Year. Wow, because I haven't been here that long. Great. So here we are. Right. So we put it together in the first half of years. And then this year, there's uh, Sean Bonacera. Um, he's a tech ed teacher at uh, Edison. And uh, they won PT Design Award at the Piscataway First Tech Challenge. And um, they also won for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, the first award uh, at a tech challenge uh, qualifying competition at Livingston High School. So they, they won two awards, and uh, they're off and running with that. Robotics is sort of like you know the precursor to engineering, as, as far as I understand it to be. Um, so looking forward, uh, we want to go beyond awareness. And so now we're moving towards infusing project-based STEM activities, kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, there is, like I said, a, a great momentum. You know it's a great sign when you're having your last STEM committee meeting of the year, and three new people show up. That was exciting for me. So. Um, we're, we're growing in our enthusiasm and one of the things that always comes back to those teachers is uh, you know they share ideas about all these different cool activities and we just want to keep putting them together uh, one one thought that actually Lori Karecki was helping me with was the idea of podcasting some of their activities it's because I hate to have to sit a teacher down and say could you write up a lesson plan but it wouldn't be so bad to have them you know do a podcast on it and then maybe post what uh, the teacher used for that so you know that's that's pie in the sky but who knows maybe next year we'll be talking about our awesome podcasts and doing a presentation on that who knows so um, but getting the word out is what the STEM committee teachers want to do get the word out build a, a database as it says up there of activities um, the kindergarten wraparound program is a great place to start looking at how uh, early STEM instruction can engage students um, so that, that'll be a great opportunity for us to use some of those 
Uh, there's a couple of curricula out there that, that can do that, so we can evaluate that a, a bit as well. And um, just really leveraging the student interest in hands-on learning. I think I skipped the, is the STEM camp up? Yeah, there it is, the summer STEM camp for students. So uh, we're going to have a, a, a modest, you know, um, camp start up this summer, July 8 through 12, and our own staff who, uh, who will, uh, we had a lot of applicants, so I'm, I'm uh, about to be pulling uh, those staff in to let them know that they'll be working uh, in the STEM camp. And, and those who might not have, um, have the opportunity to do that with us, maybe we'll do something after school next year. So we just hope that we can keep the momentum rolling. And that STEM camp is for those students entering grades three to grades eight. Correct, thank you for reminding me otherwise. So yes, rising students from grades three to eight in Edison School, but just send in your registration and call us. So the last slide I just wanted to show yet one more recognition, and uh, that's the Science Olympiad. Um, I know it's kind of cheating because it's only the S in STEM, but it's a great picture, and <laughs> I thought I would put it in there. So I, I thought I would conclude with that happy picture of our kids thriving in the sciences and uh, indicate that, they, that we're only just starting. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I just, uh, one, uh, just one quick comment that I don't know if any of you saw an 18-year-old in California who was a product, mm -hmm. a, public, a public school in California, a product of a really good STEM program and actually a STEM summer camp last summer. She has figured out somehow uh, a way, instead of taking overnight to charge our phones, to do it in 20 to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And she is now won the lot, basically. But she, <laughs> but she did it. Um, you know, and credits it all to all the STEM work that was done at her school, and uh, it's quite a quite a story. And STEM matters, yeah. big time. Yes. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Okay, we'll take this. Moving on, I would ask the board to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on May 7, 2013, and the private minutes of May 7, 2013, noting that such minutes were initially moved by uh, me, not by Roseanne, as noted in the minutes. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, all in f any comments or questions? Small comment. I sure. didn't leave the flag, but. Oh, I think I did. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So noted, Brenda. <laughs> so noted. Thanks, Brenda. Ginny needs to have accurate records. Yes. <laughs> you know, we'll I will point out. Can tell you 11 me. years ago who uh, led it. That's funny you mentioned that. Me. That was literally my first flag salute tonight. Really? It was first time. I've, I've never said a word, but it was the first oh, time I noticed Brenda, that. we're going to give you a oh, turn also. Sure. <laughs> I had my turn already. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that flag or that yeah. Yeah. Mitch had to read the... <laughs> All those in, I can't, if I could read that far. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Whatever. Abstain? All right. Personnel, Mark. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like the board to consider personnel motions number 1 through 22, um, but numbers 8 and 9 are amended at your table uh, for some minor changes in number 8, um, which I'll come back to in a second. Uh, the title was incorrect. And there were some details in number nine that were modified. Um, can I? Yes, Jim? Um, am I your second? No, not yet. I, just, you know, I was just about to ask for a second. Second? <laughs> Did you have a question? No. no. I just second. wanted to be supportive. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Dolan, retirement? <laughs> I do. Have, we have one retirement this evening. <laughs> Anna Marie Kostler is retiring after serving McKinley School's special education students as a resource room teacher for 20 years. She is connected to her students and makes meaningful connections to learning for them so that they can experience success. Anna Marie has also lived in Westfield for 37 years and credits the Westfield Public Schools for the academic and life accomplishments of her own three children. Anna Marie says that she has spent a most enjoyable 20 years at McKinley due to wonderful students, great colleagues, and a super short commute to work. <laughs> we certainly wish, wish her well in retirement. Thank you. Uh, and uh, back to number eight. Um, item eight this evening will appoint Maureen, Maureen Mazuris as the Director of Guidance for the district. Um, I was fortunate enough to represent the board on the search committee for this position. Maureen, who has more than 25 years of counseling experience, 
easily demonstrated that she was the best candidate for the position. She was warm and passionate about her responsibilities and brings with her the ability to help prepare our kids for their post high school goals and for the day to day management of the many guidance related issues that present themselves in a district with 6,300 kids. The committee was looking for someone who could lead a department, who could interact with administration, teachers, children, and parents, and who demonstrated that this is really what they wanted to do as the next step in their career. I'm certain that Maureen will bring the same passion she showed in her interview to her new dish, to her uh, to our district in her new role. Um, and any questions? If I could also just speak to um, agenda item number seven. Um, on uh, that agenda item, uh, we're calling for the appointment of uh, Margaret McFadden um, to um, serve as interim assistant principal at Westfield High School. Um, as you might imagine, having a person, uh, Derek Nelson, we had honored him at a previous board meeting because he's being deployed to Afghanistan for a year. And as you might imagine, finding a good, committed, interim assistant principal who can walk in for a year and make sure everything is working well and um, it is a difficult, uh, a difficult task. And we, um, uh, we did do a search uh, within the district and we found uh, Maggie McFadden who has uh, worked in our schools, taught in our schools for over 30 years and uh, has shown commitment in a number of ways. Stepped forward actually last year for uh, a short interim position. Um, so we're very pleased to um, put her uh, appointment on the agenda this evening as well. Thank you. Any qu other questions or comments? Dana, please. Chris McKessick? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kirsten? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Thank you. And, and actually, we have um, Maggie McFadden in the audience tonight. I don't know if you'd like to say a few <laughs> words. I don't know that. <laughs> well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for the appointment. Thank you for your vote of confidence. I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. It means that I did a really good job last year. That's the way I look at it. And um, I'm, my goal is to make this transition very smooth. Uh, I am here for a year. I told Derek I expect him back September 2014. And um, I'm really happy to be a part of the team. The team's a great team. It's, you guys have some good assistant principals at the high school. And my goal is to try to just continue on with that tradition. So um, I'm, hopefully I won't let anybody down. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> and then actually um, Maureen Mazaris would have been here, but um, she had previously accepted uh, an invitation to the College Women's Club dinner this evening. Um, so she did uh, share a few words that I will share with you. To the Board of Education, thank you for the opportunity to serve as the Director of Guidance for the Westfield Public Schools. I am eager to get started. Thank you too to the members of the interview committee whose questions were challenging and indicative of their understanding of the broad scope of the duties and responsibilities of a guidance director. I believe the Westfield Counseling Department that has an energizing combination of stability and growth that I will continue to foster. That's it. So. <coughs> okay, facilities. Uh, we have our next facilities meeting May 30th? May 31st. May 31st. And Dana, if you could just give us any update <laughs> on the roof project. Sure. Um, as you know, we've awarded contracts for the high school roof, the Roosevelt roof, and the Washington roof. Um, we have started meeting with the contractors and are planning um, for the work that will be done this summer. Um, work will start June 26th, the day after school closes at all three schools. The basketball and volleyball programs that are usually um, held in the high school gyms in the summer are going to be moved to Edison this summer. The wrestling program that's usually held at the high school is going to be moved to Lincoln. Um, none of the fields are affected, so all the programs, the high school programs that use the fields in the summer will be fine. Um, the town's summer playground that is at, held at Washington will not be held at Washington. Um, the town has moved those counselors to Wilson and Franklin where they expect uh, kids will kind of divvy up between those two schools. Um, so at this point, we're moving along as planned. Great. 
That's great. And the the volleyball and basketball at Edison will have been impacted mm -hmm. by the work in Edison. <coughs> No, the, um, we are doing the, the boiler work and we're doing bleachers at Edison. Right. Um, the bleachers are going to be um, removed the week of June 17th. Okay. Um, and then installation will start in August. So in the meantime, they'll be able to use that facility even though the bleachers won't be there. Um, and then the boiler work won't impact uh, any students. And then where will they go in August? I believe the program ends August oh. 12th or something. Mm -hmm. The second half of August, so they'll be back in the high school? There's, yeah, the high school gyms we're hoping to have back online <coughs> okay. in mid-August. Okay. Um, you know, obviously weather is going to play a big factor, but we, we're thinking that we'll have the high school gyms back. They're going to start working over the gyms, so that those should be the first areas that we can use again in August. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Long-range planning. Jenny. No report at this time. Thank you. Policies? Gretchen? Anyone? I okay. am. Okay. Yes. Um, I would like to ask the board to approve for second reading the following policy um, bylaws and policy 0131. Oh, uh, may I please have a second? Second. Thank you, Ann. Uh, comments and questions? Ginny. Yes, thank you. Um, Thank you for rewriting the first paragraph. <clears throat> I think it, um, it flows much better. Yes. Are you still there? I'm not quite there yet. I'm I know. I was waiting for it. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> uh, you can. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, I thought that there might be enhanced by one paragraph insertion. <laughs> Midway down on the right-hand side of the red, there's a, a sentence that starts with all. Got it. All members of the board must be given mm -hmm. written notice. It's about the difference between the bylaw mm -hmm. um, and the policy. repeal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worthy of having its own um, distinct paragraph. Um, given my choices, I might also place the word bylaw <coughs> before proposal. Um, one, one line up from the bottom of that um, paragraph. So let's see. Ten days prior to the date of the meeting at which the bylaw proposal is first placed on the board's agenda. It's just a reinforcement. I don't know where you are. Okay. The end of the paragraph. One line up. At which the bylaw proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I also had uh, some thoughts about the uh, paragraph on page two of three that uh, is the conversation about the five-year <clears throat> review cycle. It's a new paragraph that's being put into the policy. The five-year review cycle, the, uh, the changes when there, are, when there are no changes recommended, the idea of marking a policy reviewed with the date of review, and then the idea of placing it I don't know how, but informing the board and noting so in the minutes. Um, because the language, um, because I was struggling with the language, I actually wrote a possible paragraph. I made copies. I will hand them out um, so that you have something to look at. Because I know it's and I, know, I realize this is second reading, but um, I, I hope you will agree that there's some clarity to be gained. Number one paragraph is the current proposal, followed by number two paragraph, which is my marked up edited version. And part three is my cleaned up proposal. <clears throat> The first paragraph, the first sentence, um, I think is important to identify that not just any board committee, but the board policy committee is the one that is chartered with doing the review of policies and bylaws. And it also introduces the concept that there will be a five-year review cycle in a, a, a very um, 
direct expository way. So the first sentence, by all bylaws and policies will be reviewed by the Board Policy Committee in accordance with a five-year review cycle. Can, I, can, I just, can, can we do a sentence by sentence, maybe? That is um, the first sentence, yes. Right. Um, so I, I think policy is a good clarification, adding the committee. Um, accordance with a five-year review cycle instead of the five-year review cycle because it is previously mentioned that there will be a review cycle. Oh, where is it mentioned? I missed that. Um, I thought this was the first mention. So I three. I, it's, um, it's in three B above. Oh, okay. Is it called that a yeah. five-year review at cycle? At least once every five. Oh, at least every one. At least okay. every once every five years. Then, then that is fine. Okay. <laughs> That was original. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Um, thank you. I guess this the second uh, sentence is is a, a separation of the original first sentence into two two parts. The second sentence being the second part of the original first. Bylaws and policies reviewed during this five-year cycle, for which no changes are recommended, shall be marked reviewed with the date of review. I think that that's. Just, just Same, the yeah. statement of intent. Right. Um, the third sentence. The policy committee, in other words, naming the right. responsible party, mm -hmm. shall present reviewed policies to the board, which is a little different than shall be the board shall be informed. Um, so shall present reviewed policies to the board at their next scheduled regular board meeting. Now that's up for discussion. It could be at a regular, it doesn't have to be the next, but my thinking is that it should be codified that the ex ex expectation is that it will occur at a board meeting. Uh, so are we approving them? Are we, no. what do we do, what does it mean to present them? Well, I don't know because otherwise we're informed. My, my final sentence is, <laughs> policies marked reviewed shall be listed on the agenda mm -hmm. and noted in the minutes of the board meeting at which they are presented to the board or reviewed by the board or noted by the board. So if they were equivalent to notes for the record? They could be. That would make sense to me. Yes. If they are presented more formally, then I would feel we'd have to... I don't think Do they're something. causing action. Right. That was the original intent, as I understood it from the policy committee, was that no action would be taken, but, but they would be recognized and in the minutes. And if so, I would like to see them in the agenda, which gives recognition to the fact that they will be, there'll be an opportunity for discussion, and they'll be noted then, not only in the agenda, but in the minutes, as a, as a formal record of, of their coming before sure. the board. Dana, could they be simply in the notes for the record? Notes, whatever it is, no. notes for that. They would be in the notes for the record, not in the policy section? Right, then we don't. Because you're not taking action on acting. Oh, oh, okay. So, so, it's, so it's not an action right. request. But they're on the agenda and in the minutes. Right. right. And I didn't um, want to, I wasn't sure that I wanted to specify in the notes for the record. Yeah. I thought that that was right. a little too specific. And the agenda structure might change at some future date, right. but as long as the intent is to have them recorded, maybe recorded is a better way to say it, Rich, than presented. Sure. Recorded in the notes for the record? Um, or just recorded? I don't think that's fine. Where would you say that? The policy committee shall... I, I, I'm, I'm stuck on the word present in the first. The policy committee shall present reviewed policies to the board at the next scheduled at their next scheduled regular meeting. Well, if we can find a word for present, do you, do you that need, would be fine. Do you need the sentence? How about the policy <coughs> committee shall note such policies to the board at their re next regular, next scheduled regular board meeting? That's fine. Okay. Note, announce. Well, announce. Communic say, let's say communicate. note, because then it's going under notes for Right, record. okay. Note. Note such policies. And does it have to say at the it next did. scheduled meeting or just it doesn't at a regular? It could be at, at, at a, a regular. Regular. At a regular scheduled. At a scheduled regular board meeting, I guess is what At a what? It already says scheduled regular board meeting. Is that correct, though? Well, that's generally what we do. Okay. We schedule regular board meetings. Scheduled, okay, at a scheduled regular board meeting. 
policies marked reviewed shall be listed on the agenda and noted in the minutes of the board listed on the agenda in the notes for the record <coughs> I don't know that you need to or just say listed in the notes for the record right or, or you you could or you could just you keep it listed on an agenda and decide for now it'll be in notes for the record and okay. if you wanted to change you don't have to change the policy. Actually, it could probably, the sentence could probably end right after listed. meeting in the minutes of the board meeting. I'm sorry, what? The last sentence could probably end mm -hmm. right after the phrase board meeting. Board meeting, right, okay. So, okay, can I read it back to see if I got it correctly? All bylaws and policies will be reviewed by the Board Policy Committee in accordance with the five-year review cycle. Bylaws and policies reviewed during this five-year cycle, I might say the five-year cycle, for which no changes are recommended, shall be marked reviewed with the date of review. The Policy Committee shall note reviewed policies to the Board at a scheduled regular board meeting. Such policies shall be listed on the agenda and noted in the minutes of the board meeting. That's fine. Okay. Now the question is, is this substantively changing the content or is this clarifying the content? Because that will change, that will change, if it's just clarifying, then we can approve it for second reading. If it's a substantive change, then we need to put it up for first reading again. I think it's clarifying. I did but too. I did too. It, too. It, was, it was my attempt yes. to just make it um, to clarify. Se sequentially right. factual as to okay. what you wanted to say originally. So if other people agree that it is just clarifying and there are no other comments, I think we're good to vote. Yes. And Carrie? And Carrie. Yes. <laughs> Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kirsten? Yes. Ginny Light? Yes, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Yep. I think that does clarify. Thanks for putting um, a lot of effort into this. And I would also, now I have to find my page again. <laughs> I would also like to ask the board to affirm the superintendent's decision on HIV incidences 13H S02, 13WA10, 13T04, 13T05, 13E09 for the reasons set forth therein. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mark. Second. Do I do a sheet? Rich Matesic? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Gallagher? Yes. Roseanne Kirsten? Yes. Any lights? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. I would also like to note that as has been presented and talked about um, previously, it is the district's intention to revert back to the attendance zone policies. The, the attendance zones for Edison and Roosevelt beginning in September of 2014. Now the attendance zones are not, the delineation of the attendance zones are not a policy but the regulations. So the board does not vote on this um, change. But since we have been talking about it, I wanted to just clarify because the policy committee did take a look at the regulations um, which articulate the delineation of the different zones and uh, you guys had it at your, in your packets and a revised version is at your table that um, significantly revises the information oh. of things that was, were left out like the six, the seventh, seventh and eighth, and eighth graders, graders, right? To be oh yeah, my. more <laughs> uh, <laughs> inclusive we of them. all students. Them. Them. Um, <laughs> what what I would love to see is a map projected for for conversation at the table, um, so that we could actually 
have this discussion with a visual aid. I left the map at home, but we could certainly do that, I would think, yes? Um, uh, yes, I mean, this is just uh, bringing it up to the table. Context. Yes, it's bring, we're bringing it up to the table as something that um, I know we have discussed, um, and the policy committee, along with Dr. Dolan, uh, um, we're putting it into more specific terms since we have been talking about a broad stroke. Um, again, there is no board action at this time. We're just bringing it to the table. And um, we can certainly have, a, I, I would think we could have a map. <clears throat> but there's show. no action needed. There's That's no right. action needed. That's well, I, I think the, the action is our confidence in the language that it represents the intention that we have um, supported with the, re, the end of redistricting. Was there a vote initially? I'm confused. There's no vote now, but was there a vote initially when this was put in place? So yes, there there was. Um, there was because there was a time where the attendance zones were in a regulation like here. Then there was a time where they were in a policy, not in a regulation. And then the most recent time where the board approved both the policy and the regulations, the attendance zones went back to where they had been previously, which is in the regulation. Right? Having been embedded at one point in the policy, in order to change them, they had to be voted on. And that was the change to the redistricting language and the redistricting process. Um, but I, I appreciate the fact that uh, that the seventh and eighth grade language was not here, as I found out this evening when I was trying to study what the implication of this information meant. Um, and the other thing that I noticed, and I, it may actually appear in the new language, although I don't have time to analyze it, um, the moving forward of the next second year. So if that has also been incorporated, I will find that out as soon as I can study it. Yes. Yes. It has been. Mm -hmm. Well, the way I understand it, it has been. Um, so yes, we yes. can certainly yes. bring a map out and do some well, I think for our, for our understanding, so that we have all of the options and the scenarios well understood, and, and then for the public to know that we have taken the time to look through it appropriately, I think it's, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay. Right. And just in case there are you know, parents out there who have children in certain grades, so to reiterate, we're not changing anything that we've discussed previously right. when we said it as long ago as at least a year ago. That so <coughs> the students going into sixth grade next year, um, the redistricted areas are still in place, but starting in September 2014, because the enrollment bubbles that we had over the last several years, because we are not having them going forward, um, starting in September 2014, starting with the sixth graders, we'll be able to go back to the way that people who've lived in Westfield have known for a, a fairly long period of time. Right, starting in 2014 with sixth graders. The students who are already in whatever school in middle school, whatever school that is, they'll remain in that school. We're not moving any children once they've started in a middle school. They'll stay where they are. It's just we'll start with the sixth graders beginning in 2014. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Curriculum, instruction, and programs. No report. Thank you. Finance, Mark. Uh, Finance Committee met uh, last Friday morning. Uh, two major, um, uh, two of the uh, agenda items. One was uh, some discussion around the financing details of our uh, upcoming bond issuance. Uh, we'll have more details on that um, as uh, we have them. Um, but I, I think we're in, uh, in a good place right now with understanding exactly how we're going to uh, do the bond issuance and, and minimize the overall cost uh, to the taxpayers um, of the debt. Uh, and then the other agenda item was uh, just a uh, ongoing uh, continuing review of our progress against budget for the fiscal year um, and how we are progressing. We seem to be progressing uh, against the budget well. Um, and then we'll have more details on that as well as the uh, fiscal year comes to an end at the end of June. Um, and that will uh, you know, help us gauge uh, what dollars we'll have available for maintenance reserve and, uh, and, and additional work that we want to do uh, in, the, in the district. 
Uh, any questions or comments on that? Uh, so I would ask the board to consider, um, and we have a couple of changes, um, uh, resolutions uh, number one as amended, two and three, four as amended, five we're going to table for this evening, and then six through 12. Can I have a second? Second. Mitch, thank you. Or comments or questions? Roseanne, you got your hand on your no, head. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm just um, with respect to number one, uh, which is uh, about the uh, Lincoln Kindergarten program, uh, kindergarten students registered at Lincoln School for the years uh, for the year 2013-2014 school year may participate in a new fee-based wraparound program that will feature science, math activities, as well as reading slash writing and fun projects. Lincoln School Kindergarten is a half-day public school program where students attend either a morning or an afternoon session. The wraparound portion will permit AM kindergartners to remain at Lincoln School through lunch, then transition to the wraparound program ending at 3.20 p.m. Conversely, PM kind kindergartners can attend the wraparound program beginning at 9.05 a.m., stay through lunch, and enter their regular kindergarten classroom in the afternoon. It will follow the Westfield Public School calendar. Enrollment in the wraparound program is limited to 20 students per session. Students must be registered for Lincoln School Kindergarten for the 2013-2014 school year. If necessary, there will be a lottery held on May 24th at 10 a.m. at Lincoln School. Notification of enrollment will be by email and phone. Tuition for the full school year five-day wraparound program will be $350 per month. Registration forms for the wraparound program can be found online at the district website at www.westfieldnjk12.org backslash Lincoln. Just a quick update. Um, as of this afternoon, there were 39 people who wow. had submitted. Oh, wow. So we believe that by the time uh, we uh, close this, the registration, that we will be having a lottery, which is a wonderful thing, actually. When did it close? It closes May 24th at 10 a.m. Thank you. Doctor, um, are, will scholarships be provided for families who might not be able to afford the? Yes, if there are parents who cannot afford it, for example, those um, the students who might qualify for the families who might qualify for free reduced lunch, mm -hmm. then uh, scholarships would be provided for that. Okay. Any other questions? Dana, please. Rich Matessa. Yes. Ann Carey. Yes. Mark Friedman. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kirsten. Yes. Jenny Lights. Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. <coughs> Anything else, Mark? No, thank you. All right. Uh, with that, I would ask the board to note the notes for the record and then move to legislation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the legislation committee has two resolutions for the board to consider for approval tonight. And uh, just to wake everybody up, I want to take them separately and in reverse order. <laughs> oh. I'm going to read it backwards. <laughs> in Mandarin. Please. And here in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we will take the resolution opposing the school's development authority assessments in the state budget first. And there are amended copies at your places. So I would ask the board to consider and approve the resolution opposing the school's development authority assessments in the state budget. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Brenda. So first I'd like to give some background, um, and then even though the resolution is long, I will read it into the record. According to the Nonpartisan Office of Legislative Services, in its annual analysis of the governor's proposed budget, almost half of New Jersey school districts will see a net loss in state aid due to the construction grant fees or schools development authority assessments. Westfield is one of these districts. As you will all remember, Westfield's state aid was increased by $1 for the coming year. A $1 increase is not a meaningful increase in terms of student achievement. 
and at the same time, $75,230 will be deducted from our state aid for a Schools Development Authority assessment. After accounting for Westfield's increased assessment, our district will experience a decrease in state aid for fiscal 2014 of $75,229. I would like to clarify exactly what schools development authority assessments are for the public. They are fees that cover a portion of the principal and interest on bonds used to fund construction grants that were floated by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, later called the Schools Development Authority. The upfront grants covered up to 40% of eligible construction costs in non-Abbott districts, as Westfield is. They were designed to reduce the amount of money districts needed to borrow for facility projects, and in the process, reduce the reliance on local property taxes for needed construction and renovation of our facilities. When we received these grants, it was with the understanding that they were grants, not loans, to be paid back at a future time. The relationship between state taxes, state aid for school districts, and local property taxes must be underscored. It is important to remember that the taxpayers of Westfield pay more than $74 million in state taxes and will get back this year only $2.8 million in state aid for our schools. State aid accounts for a mere 3% of our budget. The Westfield Public Schools are almost entirely paid for by Westfield property taxes. $2.8 million is a drop in the bucket of our $88.9 million budget and we have still not been made whole from the $4.2 million cut that Governor Christie made to our state aid in his first year of office. The budget hearings are now ongoing in Trenton. The Senate Budget Committee met yesterday, and part of the discussion was about the school's development authority assessments. According to the New Jersey School Boards Association, everyone is in agreement that it is a top priority to get these assessments lowered. That is why it is important that our legislators hear from us now. Many districts are raising their voices in opposition, and that is the purpose of our resolution tonight. And so I would like to, with your patience, read the rather long resolution into the record. Westfield Board of Education resolution opposing the school's development authority assessments in the state budget. Whereas the Westfield Board of Education is responsible for providing a thorough and efficient education to the 6,310 students in our district, K through 12th grade, and whereas the taxpayers of Westfield pay more than $74 million in state taxes annually and the proposed state aid in fiscal 2014 for Westfield schools is $2.8 million, and whereas 92% of school funding in Westfield is paid for through Westfield property taxes totaling $88.9 million, which is in addition to the above mentioned $74 million in state taxes, and whereas 3% of school funding is received in basic state aid, and whereas the proposed fiscal 2014 state budget provides for one additional dollar in state aid for the 2013-2014 school year as compared to the prior school year. And whereas $75,230 will be deducted from the Westfield School District state aid for a school's development authority assessment, and whereas these increased fees cover a portion of the principal and interest on bonds floated by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority and later the Schools Development Authority to fund construction grants. And whereas the grants covered up to 40% of eligible construction costs in non-district, uh, I'm sorry, in non-Abbott districts and were designed to reduce the amount of money districts needed to borrow for facility projects and in the process reduce the reliance on local property taxes, 
for needed construction and renovation, and whereas this money was awarded as a grant, not a loan, without stipulating that the state could recapture such funds in the future, and whereas these grants are no longer available to help districts ease the burden on local taxpayers. For example, when the Westfield School District bonded the recent roof project, there were no state dollars available for the district to apply for. And whereas Westfield student enrollment has grown 30% since 1991, while state aid has dropped 67%, and whereas the Westfield School Board has tried to lower the tax burden on Westfield taxpayers by keeping our per pupil spending below the state average, conserving energy, participating in shared service cooperatives for busing, equipment, and field scheduling and maintenance, and developing in-district programs for special needs students that are cost efficient. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Westfield Board of Education, in its continued effort to provide cost-effective operations to Westfield taxpayers, calls on Governor Chris Christie, Senator Tom Keene, Jr., Assemblyman John Bramnick, and Assemblywoman Nancy Munez to rescind Westfield's School Development Authority assessment in the amount of $75,230, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to members of the 21st Legislative District Delegation, the Legislative Leadership, the Governor of the State of New Jersey, and to the New Jersey School Boards Association, and that a copy become part of the permanent records of the Westfield Board of Education. So now I would here, here. open up the floor <laughs> for discussion or questions. Just one question. Are we, um, we have support of our local government, our mayor, are they behind this? Are they, will they, can they help us with this? I have not discussed it with them. Um, we certainly could. Okay. But I, think, I really I think, it think it's, you know, the state legislators that could talk to their colleagues on the budget committee. Right. I don't think it's a town issue, which mm -hmm. typically the school board and the town don't mix financings. Um, I do think, as you called out in the resolution, that we're calling on the governor, the senator, assemblyman, assemblywoman. I think that's the proper forum. No, I agree. I just looking for all the support we can get. That's all. Sure. And thank you for um, making it a one-page resolution. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> well, no, it's an excellent job because these <laughs> things will be viewed on a page. So that's an excellent job and um, putting a copy in the permanent records. Um, changing the title, which I think is very appropriate to an, a, identify that the opposition is to the School Development Authority assessment. Um, I don't know if it's critical. I might consider putting New Jersey in front of state budget, just qualifying that it's the New Jersey state budget. I like to have that kind of identity. Um, when people pick up a piece of paper that it, it has some kind of, um, it clarifies who Westfield, where Westfield is, but, but again, sure. I think it, the legislative committee did an excellent job in bringing the, uh, the data together and the, uh, the salient issues. And it does sound like there's some movement in Trenton, so um, I'm not sure that it'll be totally rescinded, but there is talk of it being lowered. So. And for, I for prior years, <coughs> or, I mean, is there an expectation now that it's going to continue? Yeah, well, there's an expectation that it will continue, but there's a possibility of the $75,000. It would be lower than that. $1 would be good. Yeah. I also like the idea that you um, that you added that phrase about without stipulating that the state could recapture because that is critical um, to the intent that we um, chose to apply for those that in the grant right that we were not paying it back in the future that it was in fact free of free of charge right. and without any future um, encumbrance right. and there were many years when we didn't pay this. I mean, it just started in oh. 2011. So 
for many, many years. We whole other years. <laughs> was this a, t a project? Do you know that whether the underlying project was something, was that something that the taxpayers voted on? So it was like a bond project? Yeah. Yes. I believe it was the high school. That's what they were. Was, they were right. bonded projects. So we, went we out had to, so we went out to taxpayers to vote on something, with an, uh, telling them that the state was going to cover 40%. Yes. Well, we went on, well, we asked for a reduced amount of money. The program to say that. Yeah. Yes. We asked well, for a reduced amount of money because there was an expectation and a guarantee that we were getting the 40% less. Right. That's the point. The 40% is, is that part. the town believed it was approving a certain amount for a project. That's when right. In fact, it's now paying more. That's right. right. Illegal, I call it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, terrific. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll vote. Richard Matassa? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Gallion? Yes. Suzanne <coughs> Kirsta? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. <coughs> okay, and so now, um, next I would ask the board to approve. Oh, I have so many papers here. Yeah, in stage left. <laughs> ah, okay, so next I would ask the board to approve the second resolution entitled the Westfield Board of Education Resolution Undermining the Board's Ability to Subcontract Services Opposing Senate Bill 1191 and Assembly Bill 3960. <clears throat> so the second, the second. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, second? Second. Second. Ginny or Brendan, whoever went up first. Ginny. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so the second resolution opposes Senate Bill 1191 and Assembly Bill 3960, which would undermine the board's ability to subcontract services. A synopsis, a synopsis of the bill states that it allows establishment of countywide purchasing systems for certain school district services offers employment protections for certain food or custodial <coughs> services employees and regulates subcontracting by districts and public higher education institutions. Our reason for opposing the bill is because currently the district is guaranteed a yearly profit by our food <coughs> vendor, Chartwells. In the coming school year, we have been guaranteed a profit of $30,000 while maintaining fair pricing for our students. The bill would mandate our participation in a countywide contract for food services if Union County were to establish a countywide contract. A countywide contract may not guarantee us a profit as our current vendor does. According to the New Jersey School Boards Association, the bill has passed the Senate and is very likely to pass the Assembly. The governor, however, has said that he will not sign this bill but school boards feels that it's important for districts such as ours that would be affected to raise our voices because the NJEA is a um, proponent of the bill and they're pressuring the governor and not that they have a great relationship, but he might bend to them and, and sign it. Um, so they feel that we should um, definitely put this resolution um, out and approve it. So I will now read this resolution. It's shorter, though. <laughs> just, Sing it. And before you do, um, yes. just to point out, not only in the past and, and next year do we expect, um, or we have not always had a profit, but we expect a profit. We have in the past had a profit from our uh, food service vendor. But we've also been able to turn those funds into improvements within our food service areas. So those dollars go directly back into food service, mm -hmm. whether Absolutely. it's an upgrade yeah. in the cafeteria lines or developing different fast um, you know, access kinds of uh, products yeah. or machinery right. within the kitchen. So this is a really critical outcome for us. We've, uh, we've had excellent negotiating for the, for the contracts and we've had really good service and we've been able to maintain an upgrade facility. Right. And I, mean, I think the key is here that they guarantee it to us. Um, and so if we had to go to a county-wide contract, there would be no guarantee. Right. So we might break even 
Right. But there would be no guarantee. Why is the NJEA a proponent of this? Well, because the other piece of the bill is um, that the unions would be awarded more time. Like if we were to privatize our custodial staff, mm -hmm. for instance, we could do that tomorrow. And this bill calls for, I believe it's 90 days, it might be 60 days. So, but that's really not the piece of the bill that we're mm -hmm. focused on. Right. It's really the um, countywide contracts that we're focused on. But that's the other piece is what they're focused on. So. Right. Okay. So Westfield Board of Education resolution undermining the board's ability to subcontract services opposing Senate 1191 and Assembly 3960. Whereas the Westfield Board of Education represents the community's <coughs> interests in the governance and budget oversight that serves the educational needs of 6,310 students, and whereas we continually strive to provide cost-effective ways to deliver services, which frees up funds to be used in the classroom to promote student achievement, and whereas Westfield has found subcontracting of services, such as cafeteria services, is an option that has saved a substantial amount of tax dollars every year, and whereas Westfield currently privatizes cafeteria services and our current vendor has guaranteed a profit of $30,000 for the 2013-2014 school year while maintaining fair pricing, and whereas Senate Bill 1191 and Assembly Bill 3960 of the 2012-2013 legislative session would require Westfield to participate in a county-wide contract if Union County were to establish a county-wide contract for cafeteria services. And whereas a county-wide contract may not guarantee Westfield the quality of services, fair pricing, or a profit as our current vendor guarantees, and whereas Senate Bill 1191 and Assembly Bill 3960 are bills that would place severe obstacles on Westfield's ability to subcontract in the future, and whereas these bills would remove Westfield's option to subcontract services, thereby diverting funds from the classroom and burdening property taxpayers, now therefore be it resolved that the Westfield Board of Education, in its continued effort to provide cost-effective school operations to the Westfield taxpayer, opposes Senate Bill 1191 and Assembly Bill 3960, and be it further resolved that the Westfield Board of Education calls on the New Jersey Legislature to reject any such measures that will have the effect of depleting limited resources from our classrooms, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be forwarded to Senator Tom Keene, Jr., Assemblyman John Bramnick, and Assemblywoman Nancy Munez, to the legislative leadership and to the governor of the state of New Jersey and to the New Jersey School Boards Association, and that a copy become part of the permanent records of the Westfield Board of Education. <coughs> Jenny? No. Um, in the second whereas? Yes. Uh, I personally would prefer, rather than to state we, take the pronoun, just restate Westfield. I think it has strength. Okay. Um, in the first resolved. And then change strives. Yes, yeah, strives. Westfield continually strives uh -huh. to provide cost effective ways. In the first resolves. Yes. Um, actually, I hadn't noticed that diverting funds had appeared in the last whereas, but. Um, I got stuck on the use of the word depleting resources from our classrooms. It just it just didn't make sense to me. Diverting from the classrooms is fine. I don't have a problem with it being repeated. Depleting is diverted. Where's diverted the first. The first one's in the bottom of the where the last whereas. Right. Yeah. The bills um, removed. That, that's field. fine. Yeah. Okay. And then the final resolution part, the resolve, uh, I might choose to use the same sequence of identified individuals that you're forwarding, that we're forwarding the resolution to. I, I don't need, I don't, I'm not so sure why the, there was a change, except that that's probably who came to mind as you were writing it, or the committee. If there, is there a reason why they're in another sequence? 
Well, this one was written by school boards. Okay. And I wrote the other one. So. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I prefer, the, you know, I really like the other one, starting with, with governor. Chris, the governor and then working its way down through the legislative structure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so. We can just switch those out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not material. But I, I think just as a boilerplate, it's reasonable to um, keep it the same. No, no question about why the difference. Okay. Rich? Can we, uh, in each place that a profit is referenced, add the words to be used to enhance our food service operations? Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the fourth whereas, it would say, and our current vendor has guaranteed a profit of 30000 for the 2013-14 school year to be used to enhance our food service operations. Good. And then in the sixth, in the sixth, whereas it would say, a countywide contract may not guarantee Westfield the quality of services, fair pricing, or a profit as our current vendor guarantees to be used to enhance our food service operations. And more in the fourth, whereas. Uh, can we clarify who gets a profit? Because it just right now it sort of sounds like the vendor is guaranteed a profit. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, Lori brought that to my attention. So it could be the Westfield Board of Education, or the West, or the Westfield or, or Public Schools. Where we just added to be used, you could say to be used by the district to enhance our food service operations. By Westfield. To be used by the district. Westfield. By Westfield. Yeah, just give it a formal name, Westfield Public Schools. <laughs> Westfield School District. Or, yeah. Sorry, Westfield School District. I'm sorry, Rich. So I was writing about the fourth clause while you were talking about the sixth clause. So where did you want that added? In the sixth? Yeah. Uh, so it would say, uh, At the a countywide contract may not guarantee Westfield the quality of services, fair pricing, or a profit as our current vendor guarantees to be used by the Westfield School District to enhance our food service operations. Any other questions or comments? That's great. Good job. Really good job. Yeah. Okay, then I, do I have to say I, we can vote on the amended resolution since we made so many changes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, we'll what vote on the amended resolution. Rich Matezik? Yes. <coughs> Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kirsten? Yes. Jimmy Light? Yes. Ms. Taylor? Yes. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great work. Nice job. Thank you. Any unfinished business? Any new business? Ad hoc committee reports? Any liaison reports? Um, I, I attended a Uni County Ed Services Commission board meeting, um, and I may have announced at the last meeting, I don't know, that uh, the superintendent, Bill Perjudi, is uh, leaving his post as superintendent, so there is a search underway for a new superintendent for Union County Ed Services Commission. Thank you. Any other liaison reports? All right. I would ask, uh, I would recognize the public for any comments or questions on any topic. Could just restate your name, please, for the record. Ms. Mahalan. Um, I just wanted to bring up some issues going on at the state, aside from the SDA issue that we had just discussed. Um, currently, <coughs> nationwide, there is a push for charter schools uh, and vouchers. Um, this push is also very strong. Um, in New Jersey, and it affects a lot of districts, not just the Abbott districts, not just the poorer districts. Um, if I recall in recent history, Short Hills, for example, uh, had a Mandarin language program that was suggested, and um, I believe that they were able to get that turned down. But currently, the law, the way it's written, does not protect our districts. So I just wanted to kind of clarify some issues with charter schools and 
hopefully a lot of people don't know about the details, so I wanted to provide some information if that was okay. And I, um, please pardon me if I go on a little too long. I'll try to keep it short. Well, currently, a vast majority of regular operating suburban districts do not have charter schools. It would be wise for us to note the rapid expansion of these schools, the progression of implementation in other states, the student population of schools on average. And even in non-urban districts, charters pull between 7 and 11 percent of all their students from private schools. <coughs> The direct public cost of charter schools who migrated from private schools is about $1.8 billion a year. Since the most recent data available for this analysis is from 2008, that figure is likely much higher today. He went on to say that if this unintended course is not halt halted or changed, charter schools will continue to cannibalize the private sector, increasing public costs and dec decrease <coughs> options of private schools. While many know very little about how they operate and, where, and how they are approved, nationally and locally, the, mo the voucher movement and charter school movement is rapidly accelerating. There are more than 5,000 charter schools educating 2.3 million students nationwide, and charter networks are publicly traded stock options. In New Jersey, from 1997 to June 2010, over a 13-year period, there were 70 charter schools at one point or another operating within that 13-year period. Since 2010, roughly 40 charter schools were approved by the state. Several were not able to open because even though they were approved, they were not financially prepared, nor did they have proper uh, resources to open up, including buildings. Um, this year, there is roughly 37 charter schools asking to be approved. So. Um, we're really looking at almost doubling that amount in, in about three years, uh, which is you know something we really need to pay attention. These decisions will be posted of who gets approval in September of October of each year. Um, charter schools don't seek, nor are they bound to open only in poorly performing districts in Abbott towns. They can open in well performing districts like Short Hills, Maplewood, and Princeton. Such schools seek to draw students from the local and neighborhood districts by offering Mandarin, educate, Mandarin language schools, Hebrew language schools, and schools that specialize in STEM education. And while verbally we hear or we believe that this will never happen in our towns because we are well performing, that in fact the reality is we are powerless to stop it from happening. The commissioner of education is the sole authority that decides whether a charter school will be implemented in either a neighboring town that can draw from your town or your town itself. Princeton is one such town that has a charter school, which has caused inefficiencies in the district, resulting in increased budget costs to cover the programs that they once could afford to have, or they just have to cut programs. Current charter school regulations allow the DOE to place a charter school in our district at will with the ultimate decision lying solely with the Commissioner of Education. There are no legal protections or other recourse against charter school placement in well-scoring districts, nor are there protections to stop charter schools from opening in nearby towns, pulling students from Westfield, and causing the same inefficiencies <coughs> and program closures as other towns, or possible increases in taxes to maintain those programs. In fact, recent legislation has made opening charter schools in suburban districts a little bit easier by attaching takeover, um, takeover options by charter schools based on testing data issues that may not be corrected over a period of time. Because it's a little murky in the regulations, it doesn't really provide coverage for our districts. Currently, the Commissioner of Education is attempting to include online charter schools to propose changes in charter school legislation. These additional changes present another danger to the regular oper operating suburban districts budgets because, like neighboring charter school operators, they would allow an online charter school to take students from any district. In Teaneck, they were going to have to lose, I, they were supposed to set aside 50% of their budget because a charter operator decided to plant its, an online charter operator was going to plant its school in their town, and as such, the district, the host town, has to assume that all of the children would come from them. And I believe they were going to have roughly two or 5,000 students. But the, the district could pull from any 
town in the state of New Jersey. So you could live in Trenton and apply to the Teaneck School. And that is the danger of online charter schools. Aside from the fact that there is tremendously poor results in most of these districts with a lot of um, questionable financial activities. Um, the district would then have the burden to pay the charter schools 90% of the per pupil costs of the home district. So if we spend 13, thousand we're looking at sending over ten eleven thousand whatever it may be plus she would also be responsible for any transportation costs so if for example they have to go to short hills you would have to pay for the busing from westfield to short hills or wherever they would want to go in some places people will go as far as teaneck and that busing has to be picked up by the host district as well as any special needs costs as the student populations decrease in the district <coughs> the per per the per pupil costs rise due to lower ratios and fixed costs, resulting in the district paying ever-increasing per pupil costs, not only for their own district, but also to the charter school students, and creating inefficiencies due to economies of scale. Due to the very high administrative ratios of charter schools and redundant duplicated services, studies have found that charter schools expend more money on administrative costs and less on students compared to local districts, which is in complete contrast to the intended mission. Charter school funding is also burdensome, places burdensome costs on the district, and as I have stated before, removes programs and resources or increases the cost to the taxpayers to maintain those programs. Additionally, charter school boards are not accountable to local voters. They're accountable only to the Commissioner of Education. And while researching the data from the New Jersey School Report over a period of two years, I've discovered that it it would appear that, a prof a re that roughly 70% of charter schools fail to meet the New Jersey passing benchmark. And only three to five schools were slated for closure by the commissioner. Ironically, one of the three schools slated for closure was the only special needs charter school in the state. The legislators have received letters from people throughout the state expressing their concerns with the voucher program and the charter school regulation changes and approvals. However, without further input and constant pressure, <clears throat> the charter school movement and the voucher program not only will move money, remove money from the districts that could have been used for our local districts, it opens the door to future skyrocketing costs for the taxpayers with little to no representation or accountability by our elected officials. I appreciate your patience as I know this took up a lot of your time and I hope that I was able to provide more insight to, into educational issues on the state level. Your support by our letter writing to legislative officials could stave off current and future costs to our local taxpayers. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public on any topic? All right. Seeing no one come to the podium, I would ask the board to approve the following resolutions. Resolve that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters re rendered confidential by state and federal law, personnel, pending or anticipated litigation, and pending or anticipated contract negotiations, and be it further resolved that any discussion held by the board, which need not remain confidential, and the results of the discussion will be made public as soon as practicable. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We abstained. We are.